Hey everybody. Oh my gosh. I have Mark Tiffin here. I, I told him really, I believe he's like Gordon McKenzie in the book, Orbiting the Giant Hairball. If you've never read that book, then you don't know what I'm talking about. But I will say this, that Mark Tippin and Gordon McKenzie, they're both really creative geniuses in that they help people to kind of problem solve at this bigger level. Like they are the ideator 10x, right? Or 100x. And so, you know, let me just say a little bit about Mark before we get started. He's a published author. He's an international speaker. He's an instructor and remote communicator and collaborator. And he's the director of the strategic next practices at mural which is um a an online uh collaboration platform which is awesome and he's also an instructor at luma and what he does is he helps teams to unlock their potential by leading these powerful conversations and what i love about you is we're in alignment about this that Facilitation is the skill that you want to learn in the 21st century as we are getting further and further into it, because you want to be able to have these conversations with people that are authentic, where you actually listen as a leader, and that you help guide the conversation to a better, bigger place. So please put your hands together to help me welcome Mark Tibbin. Woo! Yes, Mark. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patty. What a delight to be here. Oh, gosh, I'm so happy to have you here. You know, um, it's funny because you were head of UX at Autodesk. And, you know, my friend Phil Shepard worked at Autodesk for many, many years. Yeah. And so I used to go out there all the time to Autodesk, you know, and eat lunch and stuff like that. So, yeah, I'm glad you're at Mural now. But tell people who you are. Like, what, what are you up to? Where'd you come from? Why are you here? You bet. Well, everyone can start, if they want to see Roots, do a Google search on Mark <laughs> Tippin and Punk. Those two words together and you'll see me back in the day with the Mohawk playing shows in the Bay Area. And, and that yes! was being part of a DIY community in high school where, you know, the, you know, the, the odd and the quirky uh, and the interesting and the creative um, uh, kind of bonded together. And I started a band because I wanted to do the flyers. I wanted the t-shirts. I wanted to do. The oh my God. I love and, it. <laughs> um, and we didn't know how to play. So we had a numbering system where it was like number of string and fret. And we'd pass notes <laughs> in the hallways. And then and when we got together, we'd actually then figure out, so what's the syncopation? How, what, what is the song actually about? But, um, but that, that carried through. I also, um, you know, my my dad handed me in eighth grade a copy of uh, two two Alvin Toffler books, uh, Future Shock and Third oh. Wave, and he said your nice. world's going to be really different than mine. And he was born in 1928, so a big generation difference. I was born in '68, kind of that big tumultuous year in 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 America's history. But yes, uh, so I appreciated that because they set me up for success. I had an Atari yeah. 800 computer. I typed thousands of lines of code out yes. of, you know, Antic Magazine and all that stuff. Yep. And it led me on a, a course where uh, what I appreciated about design and having two older sisters that were both very accomplished designers, kind of seeing how you could take visual skills and then apply them to storytell or to, you know, consolidate some aesthetic into an icon. And that stuff fascinated me. Yeah. Yeah. But always the technology was yeah. right there too. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that. And you mentioned now we are, now we're going to be side by side. I like that's that. Right, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's interesting because when you, when you mentioned Autodesk, I have this unique vantage point there too. I, was, I did two tours of duty. One was in the nineties before the internet. Yeah. So that right. was CD-ROM authoring and, and seeing the birth of UX design when it was, in an 8-bit studio program designing what do the buttons look like when the highlights on the top versus the bottom very yes, fundamental yes. what are the affordances mice were available then but this whole new what is this human machine interface thing and then um i went and did a couple startups and then i was invited back in 2010 and it was like a, a parallel universe marvel universe where um, i bet the 90s no one except for architects knew Autodesk. That's right. Was, That's Autodesk. right. I mean, you know, the, you had there was no CAD yet, right? Was, Autodesk didn't have it. It was like a brand new thing that was getting developed. Yeah. That's right. Wow. And then, um, then through merger <laughs> and acquisition, right yeah. now they're into Hollywood effects. 
uh, even though they couldn't talk about it on some projects because people were still touring their their investors. I know, but they were so close to Lucasfilm, right? So they were like right across the valley there. Right so there. yes. And, um, and then fast forward, wow. Um, instead of having to shuttle, you know, if you're doing a sales presentation or something, you'd have to shuttle people from SFO all the way through 19th Avenue for anyone in the Bay Area. You understand how painful that is. Up it to is Marin, painful. Do yes. your song and dance and then sh get them all the way back to the airport. Ugh. Now they have the gallery, right? Which w was a powerful way to actually highlight, not look at us in our software. It was look at what our customers are doing with the yeah. tools we're giving them. That's humbling. I mean, some of it was how to build an incubator yeah. for to cut down infant mortality using parts that were available through a culture that really understood how to keep old cars running. So it's a car battery. It's a headlamp. It's... And you really saw design come alive and and it be appropriate technology. Um, so it was there, ironically, that I was So is doing... that where you that where you became a design thinker? It was because I because that was right when design thinking was becoming a thing. Absolutely. It hit yeah. it, was, it was unique because it was ground zero for several things. We Autodesk was at this point where in the 90s, it was Dassault Systems. It was these big other enterprises that's right. that everyone was like, that's our competition. Well, 2010, we realized we're actually in competition against our users that are cobbling together workflows from the internet right. now makes it possible you can get your hands on them. And so we intentionally needed to disrupt ourselves and we needed to change business model and all that kind of stuff. So I had a team that actually spanned 12 time zones, Tel Aviv, oh, wow, okay. Hyderabad, India. Nice. And I was doing this crazy commute from Folsom, California. It's the other side of Sacramento. Yes. Um, on a good day, it's three hours one way. On a Giants game in San Francisco, it's five and a half hours. Um, yeah. Crazy. And I'd sit at a desk and then do nothing but hop on calls with my team that wasn't in the building with me. And through merger and acquisition, all this talent was being acquired. Really, the software is being acquired. And then we have all these people. What do we do with these What people? do we do with them? <laughs> these How do we fit hmm. them in? Exactly. Remember Cisco, it is just acquire, 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 acquire. No, no, you stay your unique self. And then we'd go in and facilitate for them. And it'd be like, whoa, that's a, sh that's a shit show. I mean, exactly. pardon me. But yes, we'll probably have to bleep that out. But well, yes, but, but truly, it's unbelievable. It, um, and so, so I... I was trained uh, or kind of my, my empathetic nature led me to be a kind of a servant leader, right? Hire people way smarter than you, yep. pull the rocks out of the way, set them up for success. And it was a challenge because if you weren't actually in San Francisco yeah. and around the water cooler or having that cup of coffee, then your ideas didn't get heard. And right. you, if you were outside that domain, you pretty much got relegated to just execute on what was decided. And so I was looking for a way to level the playing field. And that's when I started looking for tools like Mural. There are a few yeah. out there. Um, simultaneously, Luma was being brought into Autodesk, which is yes. one of their one of their larger. You know, if you go to the Luma site, it's got a nice little showcase on what happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but it was part of a culture transformation where you had the 3D tools for movie studios have a yes. different UI because they're doing different things than people that are building pipes underneath civic infrastructure in a city. Like, right. And yet the users were spanning across, right? Architects were saying, yeah, I have to design the bolts and this kind of, and the structural thing. Right. But then to sell it, I got to put people in there. So I'm using the Hollywood special effects stuff to put people. Yeah, in. yeah. So they didn't see a distinction between the tools. Although in, if you, you know, don't ship your org structure. Exactly. Exactly. From inside, <laughs> that's a totally different team. They're in a different part of the world. Yeah. So, um, so there was a lot. I was just had the amazing fortune to be right in the middle of this cauldron, and uh, and being a loom instructor, and having this crazy commute, I was already trying to figure out how can I do this without so much travel. And I'm running workshops, yeah. and people are flying in from around the world, and they're getting exposed to these wonderful methods, and going, "This is amazing." Now, what do I do when I go home to Switzerland and my team's in Italy and in Toronto? Yes. And I was like, yeah, that's a, that's a darn good question. And so for me, uh, the nature of human-centered design and these methods, and then a tool like Mural 
that yeah. actually gets really specific. Their personas, like facilitator is a key persona, unlike, you know, most other software. Yeah, that's is, right. You know, and a facilitator really is the key persona in a meeting. Without right. one, you really just kind of bumble around through the agenda uh, because most of you didn't have good meeting management um, 101, right? So you don't understand that you have to have a facilitator and a timekeeper and a note taker, right? But Absolutely. when you have something in an online format that actually helps to facilitate the process and keep you all engaged, which is the key when yes. we're all now in COVID, right? So, so you saw the value of that and then you got involved somehow, must have been early on because you play a key <laughs> role there now. So well, it was, again, it was one of those, um, you know, I know that you have, you have, uh, the uh, people that you've coached and helped them pivot and certain things. And I, I happened to be in the middle of that, where a massive pivot for me happened. I was, I was a manager of design people. I was getting further and further away from the, what execution. you loved, what yeah. you loved. Yeah. At the end of a day or end of a week. Remember, uh, go back to high school when the reason he had the punk band was That's because right. of the t-shirts and the posters. The fires, hands on, <laughs> making the music, writing the song. That's right. The That's right. And now Se second I'm... fret, second fret. Right. Second fret. What was that? Yeah. <laughs> Two fingers like that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> louder, louder, louder. Um, and so at the end of the week, I knew that the team had things that they had touched and they had made or they had, you know, you know, had a hands on. And I'm looking and saying, well, I can glory in my team success, but I'm totally separated from this. And it was um, the uh, the insight of my manager at the time, uh, Andrea Mangini, who's now at Netflix. She's head leading design over at Netflix. And uh, she saw an opportunity where, you know, you're pretty good. You're pretty, you got some high emotional intelligence, right? You can, you can calm varied voices down in a room and... <laughs> There's a lot of this kind human of human punching bag, means. human punching bag, human right. punching bag. It, and then you take it and, and then you turn it into love. That's right. exactly, exactly. That's human transformation. That's the, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, boundaries. Uh, so true. So true. Want. So that true. Facilitator journey is definitely that's right. a personal one, you know? Um, but that, that was a pivot where I realized now, instead of trying to stay on top of JavaScript and, and databases and, yeah. uh, and the mechanics of what the web interface, yes. there's actually this whole other layer on top of it, which is understanding the right dialogue to have at the right moment. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, is it generative? Then when it's generative and you have all these ideas, yeah. you don't yeah. pat yourself on the back. You've actually got more work to do. How do you, yeah. simplify? that's right. How do you understand? Yeah. How do you elevate? How do you pick one thing out and experiment quickly? Yeah so that you can start the loop over and put it back in front of the customer. I just think, I can't wait for you to get the Game of Innovation, that book that I'm part of, that I did the illustrations <laughs> oh, for, because yeah. you're speaking the language in that book that David Cutler wrote. So it's going to arrive in your door, I think on Friday. So look for I'm that. So it's I'm really so heavy good. and it's colorful. I think you'll like it. Oh, but I'm yes, sure. this idea of elevating the right things at the right time in a meeting is essential. Or even in a conversation that you're having around the dinner table, right? How do you get to the place where people are actually talking about what's real? That's right. That's right. And creating, creating openings um, uh, for, for that to happen and being sensitive to the fact that people are cognitively different. You know, we've, we've inadvertently found these delightful things that happen when, when the pandemic forced a new set of circumstances on us. Yeah. Now suddenly, um, the chat takes on a, a different level of importance with people that have something to say, but they yeah. don't want to interrupt the show to say it. So there are these multiple layers where people are contributing and getting a voice heard. Um, a voting mechanism in Mural is anonymous. So right away, so much of the games we play in a co-located cohort to like, okay, everyone get it in your mind, count to three, and then everyone go at the same time to try and remove the bias. Yes, yes. Remove the follow the leader. Well, it just happens now. And we have, we have some- Well, I have the tools to do it. 
right? Yeah, it just, and that's it, that's yeah. part of it. Well, I what I love about that is um, then in the evolution of what's happened with murals. So for those of you that don't know what mural is, you should just Google it, um, mural.co. And um, in there you'll find, isn't that what it is, a .co yeah, yeah. or is it? Yeah, no, so you go yeah. there, um, .com, and in, in there you'll see that it's a virtual platform in which you can play and you can structure your meetings in such a way that you have much more engagement and interaction. You can, there are templates that you can pull in and you can do all kinds of design. and you know, I've been experimenting with using it with clients so that we can, I don't know, deepen the conversation, but in both a visual and a audio, audio way, <laughs> auditory, right? Well, I think when, you know, the, when the pandemic hit, there was a steep learning curve. Yeah. Um, and, and we don't acknowledge the ones that were suddenly, there were, you know, adults who are also learning to be educators and nutritionists and everything suddenly. I mean, <laughs> God, no kidding. Oh my God. But even just uh, coming up to speed on, you know, video conferencing tools, that was something yeah. that was new and, yeah. and that helped, but I can see you and it's nice to see you, Patty. And it's, yep. uh, as yep. a facilitator, we definitely use eyeballs. That, I mean, we always did conference calls, right? But they just aren't right. very valuable when you know you can Zoom, right? Or use Teams or whatever platform right. you like, right? But you put this space in between us where we can both kind of reach through the glass and yeah. add something and now i can see what you mean right you yeah. can actually we can take any topic yeah. where we think we're aligned yes and you say okay cool draw draw what what's the order of that process that you think yeah so yeah we'll... put it into some semblance yes go, i love that yeah and i think it, it, go, that's not it at all it's yeah like exactly it i wasn't saying that where did you get that idea but <laughs> i i love that because i think um for, and I can't wait for technology to improve even more so that, and then now, you know, today I went and uh, bought a video thing so I could use my iPad while I was working in mural so that I could draw in, in a really great picture because I'm a live illustrator. So I often, even if I'm in mural and I'm doing the zoom, I'm drawing right here because yes. you can see how vibrant that is to see it. And there's something about being able to use real pastel that people go, oh my God, that looks so fantastic. And what they don't realize is that color imprints on your brain. And then if you really love something, um, even if you draw a simple picture that you love, you will remember it, you know, 80 times better than anything else, right? Absolutely. Well, and so, so if you take a snapshot, like sometimes we'll be doing a session where I'll be learning some mural process, somebody will share something and I'll take a screenshot. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did they do that? That's fantastic. Because of course I want to draw it, right? Yeah. Well, I think all the methods that, um, you know, that are generative, you get, um, you know, 16, 20 people in the session, you give them two minutes and they each generate one note a minute or more yes that's a lot of information density and yeah and so i always try and encourage people because you can draw on the notes too as opposed to just typing text in right and even the simplest little rudimentary squiggle your yeah. brain has vast way more yeah. of capacity to differentiate and and to remember the sights and smells and language in that moment when the discussion yes. happened around that's squiggle. right than the text and in right. that information density actually becomes parsable when it's visual. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I love that. Now. So, um, I want to know like when you are just being you out there and you're, um, doing your job, uh, <laughs> what is your favorite thing to do? Well, like um, if we, if you had free time to do anything, uh, what would you do? What do you so do? So uh, in my free time, I, I, I gravitate heavily towards, um, towards music just because that's, that's usually so far aside of the work, the pressure, the commerce <laughs> side of it that that's, that's yeah. interesting uh, and where I, I kind of recharge. Um, but I am also um, very fortunate, I'm going to mispronounce it, but uh, Ikigai, right? There's Ikigai, yeah. Ikigai. So you've got that Ikigai going. I took me 53 years to, f to find out what I wanted to do with my life. And it's yeah. kind of right now, um, this, this unique situation where I find myself is, uh, something I enjoy doing. I enjoy, yeah. I enjoy working with people, understanding their problems, um, 
laying out a sequence of conversations or methods, yes. whatever you want to call it, so that you harvest the collective genius in the room, right? Um, I love that moment I discovered I didn't have to have all the answers. I just had to create the space where the ideas would come from the people in the discussion and trust the process that we're going yeah. to get to something amazing because I value you and we're creating a space where we can kind of open up and share and be authentic and the radical candor and um, call BS on each other, you know, yeah. but that's all in the service of being passionate about the, the, the challenge. Um, yeah. What's, what's been hardest for you in this um, virtual um, environment that you've been in? What's been hardest for you? I'm, I'm not very good with names. And organizational savvy is something that um, it's a it's a it's a tool that if you can bring up names on the fly. I was always the slow thinker, the one who, you know, the the bully at school says the mean thing, and like two hours later, I'm riding the bus home. And like, <laughs> I oh, should have said I this. Said that. I know oh, how to get that so guy great. back. <laughs> um, so that facility with. Yeah. With, with the names. I can draw them. I know what they look like. I know what they had for breakfast and their favorite candy bar. I know all this stuff, but like the names elude me. And so, but names are important. Um, yeah. And they are, a t they are a way to engender respect and to start that, creating that space of acknowledgement and everything. Yeah. So that's one of the things where I, I do a a lot of extra heavy lifting. If I'm, oh, I was going to say, do you ever do that? I, you know, when I started to run virtual sessions where we didn't have zoom and it would yeah. just be me with the phone. And then I'd have all my trainees there, you know, I would write and draw a picture of them, what I thought they might look like on a post-it and I lay them all out on the table in front of me. See, there oh, it is. Yeah. Because I think sometimes, well, it really does matter to people that you remember their name. Yeah. It also matters that you remember things about them. Like I was on a, I don't know where I was, but the person I was interviewing was talking about how you could tell if somebody really cared about you enough to remember your children and their names. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God, that like, like that was like a stone, like hitting me on the head. And I was like, yep, you're going to remember her son's names. That's all there is to it. You're going to go find them out. And then you're going to see what they're <laughs> up to on Facebook because you can find them. And yeah. go from there, right? But I think it does matter um, because especially, wouldn't you say, Mark, in the world where it's so chaotic right now with all the stimulation, um, people are, they're very distractible. Absolutely. And the smallest kindnesses are really felt now. I mean, I'm, I, I got, uh, uh, you know, a, a handwritten thank you note for, for a kind of a relatively innocuous thing. And that was... I mean, that completely made my day because I understood that someone had to have the presence of mind to actually yeah. be thankful enough to stop their FOMO and Twitter, whatever, to stop and write something and find my address yeah. somewhere, yeah. And put a stamp on it. Um, so little things do matter. And I think that's part of this massive, great recalibration or whatever we're going to call it is um, people uh, are are finding, are, are kind of pulling out of the 80s, me, me, keeping up with the Joneses and all this kind of consumerist out of control stuff and and getting present to what really matters. And people want to, to have value and they want to be doing things that are of value. And I think the uh, we're in a hinge time between a market economy where we still got to make money, but we're shifting towards a mindset economy and um, mm, I like that. ideas matter. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. we knew this was coming, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think Malcolm Gladwell or some, one of them, you know, predicted this, that it would be a mindset economy. Although they didn't use that term. I don't know. You probably coined that term, but I like oh, it. No, I, no, he's is, got uh, a book right here. He's going to show it to us. Uh, well, it's, it's yeah, Don, yeah. Don and Marco. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Right? Collaborative it's, uh, intelligence. If you didn't catch that book when he held it up, for those of you that are just listening in the podcast, collaborative intelligence. And I think this, um, so when you think about where things are going and headed, what are you excited about? What excites you and gets you up every day? Um, well, it's funny. This, this comes up occasionally when we, you know, I, I talk with other facilitators and, and I'm curious what drives them as well. For me, it's fairly simple. When I was when I was leading these workshops with Luma, 
it was it was Will you quite explain a what luma is for sure. those people that yeah. don't know what who luma is or they're not in that world yeah tell me yeah. who's luma so luma institute was founded um uh as a spin out actually from maya design that was acquired by boston consulting group and uh a uh, dear friend of mine, Mickey McManus, he's the author of Trillions, and he's very much like- I He I name dropped you. just then, just catching you. I just want yeah. you to know his well, friend, Mickey. It, it, okay. <laughs> someone, so, yeah, someone who will occasionally take my phone call. Well, he, um, uh, I swear he lives in the future, and he'll come every once in a while and go, you should be looking at ding, 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 ding. Yeah, well, I love that. I love that. He, um, they, they were running these workshops that you and I would recognize today as kind of human-centered design thinking yes. workshops. And clients were saying, this is fantastic. Could we learn how to do this? Yes. And most consultancies, when faced with that challenge, would go, hmm, we teach you to do it, then we cannibalize our revenue. But there is a third way. And what they did is they actually founded and spun out a complete separate entity that focused on teaching people to fish. And so... Yeah. You had Chris Pacchioni and Bill Lucas and Pete Maher, the founders, and they went and looked at thousands of design thinking methods. And, yes. Uh, and, it, and everyone at the time, if you remember, you go to Amazon and, and do a search for a book, you'd get yes. two books that would show up. A thousand and one design thinking methods and exactly. another thousand and one. <laughs> so it was just like, where do you start? Well, exactly. they boiled it down to to a very inc uh, neatly done taxonomy that yes. really, it, 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 it kind of is uh, steeped down to the essential ways of, if you think of their name, uh, Luma, looking, understanding, making, and activating, right, is the A. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, that process of actually going and observing. So user research and those kind of methods. Versus a mole, which is backwards, activating, <laughs> which is most what most people That's do, right. myself included, being an activator. Really I'm going to get going activity. first and then go backwards and yeah, figure right. out what you where you blew it, right? I love Ready it. Fire All right. Yeah. So that that so that's who Luma is. And so part of it, when you think about the future then what, what inspires you about that and where things are going? I'm sorry, I detracted yeah, no, you no, from no, that direction. You. So bring us back there to my, the future yeah. you. My, my, my rattled brain needs to- like, No, 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 I'm not. refocusing because I went down that rabbit hole with you. <laughs> I led to the rabbit hole and then I pointed, go down, will you, Mark? Please <laughs> tell us about me. Luma and then everything <laughs> else. Okay, all right. So the future that so you're the, excited about. So the future I'm excited about is I've, I've seen firsthand how those that could afford it would get the benefit of these types of workshops and, and the yeah. education in a company that would buy in and fund steeping in this wonderful yeah. Esperanto of design thinking. And yes. But every time uh, I was in the Uber heading towards the big shiny building on the hill where I was doing my workshop, I'd see all of these small businesses. Yes. Yeah. I, now I wasn't sitting there thinking I can save them all. No, no, I'm, no, no. Wow. But yeah, but we're cool. thinking, what like, can we do to help these do? businesses be successful? Exactly. So the democratization of access to guided methods and a platform where you yeah. can activate better yeah. conversations that help you actually get to well-framed questions. Right? Because yes. a question is makes all the difference. Asking. Yeah. A, a cruddy question gets you a lot of cruddy non -exciting. right right framing it in a way where you go that's a problem we're solving is the beginning of an amazing journey that you can invite those people into and it changes everything it changes possibility yeah. i love that um and so if you're not a design thinking person it's really about framing the problem in a lot of ways and then ideating a solution to that problem and then iterating the um, anything that you mock up to make sure that it actually works. Cause most of the time, you know, we create things in our basement and we know that our mom loves them. So they've got to be good for the rest of the world. And we come <laughs> up with these things and then uh, no, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're not. And so, um, but when you can actually, um, test things and try them, come up with, a real problem that you're solving, then you come up with something like Uber. That's what's true. Absolutely. And then you can compare it to Lyft and you can see how they're different. And one has its own built-in mapping software so that you, you know, it's not outsourced and things like this. These make a big difference. So you're excited about this part of the future? 
yeah, that I'm people and about... entrepreneurs understand design thinking. Yeah, I'm excited. Or anyone. I mean, you, every, we all each have our own sphere of influence, right? In yeah. Your... Well, well, okay. All right. Well, then let, let's test this with you. So yeah. what's the biggest problem that you've been solving? So um, recently, I attended a design the ex you love, um, I shape herself. She has a, a wonderful thing that, that that she convenes every once in a while. And oh, um, I see. who? What? Say it I again. Shape, I shape. I shape. Herself. Okay, good. Um, Rochelle. Yes. Um, uh, she's uh, she, she's known as the queen of toilets because she's an yes, industrial she is. designer. And, yeah, yeah. So that was a, um, but the challenge that I felt, though, she said, you can plug anything you want into that statement. So the X is a variable. And I said it was a family dynamic um, was the, the thing that we went through. And so mm. part of it is two years into a pandemic, and we all feel like Bill Murray and Groundhog Day hitting the clock and going Ay, over and over and over again. How do you actually intentionally create a dynamic um in in the, the 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 family that is really your closest to and uh and provides you the support and and that's that should actually be the the best and sometimes it's put under the strain because it's the one you assume will always be there or it's yes the one you take it for granted take it for granted and that you know humans are humans and that yeah. doesn't that isn't uh, no sustained. no you have to you have to create something there all right so that um, led you to understand. Uh, yeah. So that led me to understand that, um, that it's not the kind of the hail Mary, you know, Oh, can I order that off of Amazon? Can I fix that with a, you know, I actually have to go, uh, put some intention in there yeah. and I have to yeah. look at Are you talking about your family right now? Yeah. Right? No, no. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Just okay. Kidding. Good. Yeah, yeah. Cause you know, you're a guy, so you're talking around this and I want to go in. Oh, so, yeah. okay. cause I like yeah. to get in deep. So, um, you're talking about your family. It's interesting because I was telling my wife this morning, I was saying, you know, I, this pandemic brought us closer than we've ever been, yeah. and, which is kind of a miracle because she's commandy and I'm demandy. You know what I mean? And that right, was yeah, the yeah. dynamic. When we first got married, we had to have command cards. And on one side, they would say command. And on the other side, they would say, oh, I don't even remember what it was, but it was something like truth or um, or ask or, you know, I don't know what, but yeah. you, you could only got a certain number of command cards before they were taken away and you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't do it anymore in a day. That's right. right. Well, yeah. yeah. Even acknowledging um, one of the one of the the reasons why the the dynamic works is because um, uh, my background and my family, uh, a lot of talking, not a lot, of, a lot of stuff being said, a lot of um, verbosity and loquaciousness, and you know, and bang. <laughs> if yeah. you know what that word means, loquacious, <laughs> yes, it's a lot talking, of talking, <laughs> talking, and talking incessantly, yeah. but but actually saying stuff of impact or really, yeah. Um, and a lot of circuitous time understanding, did they mean that? Or should I say this to suggest that? So, you know, whereas, uh, uh yes, well, being like, to the point, yeah, Scott's get Irish. down to it, honey. I mean, you're <laughs> yeah. going on and on about that enough context, get to the point, right? right? Say something. Will you yeah. just, yeah, say what you mean. Um, uh, and so it's, um, you know, it's a journey. Um, and there are certain, you know, certainly in the job that I do and what I'm asked to do as a facilitator, this kind of verbal grease is sometimes helpful to draw in the shy folks and all that kind of stuff. It can borderline um, on abusiveness if you just do never... it too much. If you do it too much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah um... Like um, this, I think uh, I love that you're talking about this because as a facilitator, it's a fine line that you, you walk between telling a personal story yeah. And actually getting them to talk to each other and yeah. talk to you. And yeah. sometimes you do it, um, tell the personal story to break the ice or to let them know that you are credible. I was thinking about that credibility or, um, you know, or you set it up in a way where you create a problem for them to be thinking about right then. And can, how many of you can relate and you have them raise their hand. So this is a way, an engagement technique, right? Yeah, um, but you can't do that with your family, you, you know, with your loved ones, you have to really ask well, them they, a question and then listen to what they have to say uh, and try right. stop trying to solve the problem. Just listen. Right. Absolutely. And they know all your tricks, right? I'm, 
I did <laughs> yeah. this with my dad where we got to the point where he'd start, he'd say the first three words and I go, yeah, that's story 42, dad. You know, oh, now that's story 147. Yeah, we, we've heard them all. And my, my family is now, I'm getting the same treatment. Like, yeah. You, you know, you've told me that before. <laughs> <laughs> I love and that. I, I, I know it. I know it. Well, <laughs> it's good to peel back the layers of that stuff, I think, to get to, um, you know, it's okay to sit in silence. I think this is hard for people to, you know, this is what, what we did before we had the internet <laughs> and our phone, <laughs> that people would actually have a conversation. They would enjoy the meal. They would sit in silence at night and they might read a book. Yeah. You know what I mean? And these are um, what this is about is a certain kind of stillness that we've moved away from. What do you think of that? Um, I heard recently, you, you just reminded me, I, I need to find the author of the quote, but it was uh, silence is a sound of trust. And I thought, I thought that's interesting. Silence is a what? Is the sound of trust. Of trust. And I went like, yeah. I don't know, super uncomfortableness, but, <laughs> but yeah. And, and what you're talking about with um, enjoying the meal, yeah. um, uh, there is, I can't believe I made it, you know, into my fifties before learning um, nutritionally what happens when you actually eat slower and why it's important to breathe while you eat. Yeah. Uh, and masticate it, frequently. Like I mean, it. like you're supposed to chew. Remember when they told you, you know, you chew, chew it food? 50 times or 25 times or 30 times. But well, in the, fact, you the help your digestive it, system. You're actually, the oxygen you're putting into your body while it's doing the, the work down there isn't putting more fuel. Oxygen burns. You're actually putting more oxygen into the stuff that your body is storing and making it higher quality. I was like... Why is this not? I feel like there's an instruction manual for the human body. Um, you know, yeah, you, yeah, I think that's your next book. Because, <laughs> you, you know, you've written all these other books. So why not write that book? Because that book, I think people would be very interested in. I think, I well, it's, well, I would, basically, it would be a, a list of other people, Mark David. Of course, I was going to say, yeah, like, really, right. whatever. And you, and it would be based on what your your preference is, because everybody, you could follow one, one person's expertise or another, and everybody's body is different. Completely. And so, and to me, this is about um, even as we try to pivot from one thing to another, what I want to do and pivot into is going to be vastly different from maybe even the person I was yesterday. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And so I've been trying to treat these uh, different, um, you know, years as a different person that I was, because I think it's easier to understand that you are not your personality, that you can have a personality, but that you're malleable and you'll change all the time. And you for sure have changed because um, you were a guy who was in a punk band doing this. And then you were like UX expertise and now you're strategic next practices at mural. And, you know, I mean, so when you think about the who that you want to step into, um, what would that who look like? Um, well, it's interesting. I, you know, I, I, I often time as the hair gets grayer and as I'm, you know, reminded that there are more years between me and when I had a mohawk than I than I rem I think there are in my 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 head. Um, I think there's mm -hmm. there's a few more steps. I would love to, I would love to see the emerging technology um, be developed in a space where the the human relation intelligence that happens, the things that facilitators do, um, and the methods or the conversations or whatever you want to package it, the, the technology that allows people to step through a series of inquiries or input and output, um, that those things are actually seen as one and that um, the fulfillment of the lower half of the Maslow's you know hierarchy, um, which has been eroded, our sense of belonging and grew, a lot of a lot of yeah. cavities over the last two years um, that are preventing us from being that fully self-actualized, ready to go get them person. We need to do some healing there. But when you look at that and it inverts into another pyramid above, which is how do groups become actualized, right? How do we go from being a garage band into being, you know, the Pat Metheny group or, you know, choose your own 
you know, artist yeah. that is at the peak as a team is at the peak of their practice. They, they have the skill in pocket, but now they're inventing and creating and, um, and uh, yeah, like, with, with, yeah. um, with freedom and, yeah. and, uh, you know, I think that's, that's part of it. I love that. Um, sorry, did I interrupt what you were about to say? Because I felt like there was more. So it's like going from this garage band to the Pat Metheny group or whoever it is, Beyonce or whoever your favorite is, right? The, the, the point there being, I guess the, the thing I've, I've also factor in here is, you know, I remember the seventies gas lines, right? Cars backed up and gas shortages. And yes, of course. So I was pumping gas back then. I was probably filling your tank. Just FYI. Okay, good. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> Mike so Shell, there I was. That's right. Okay, we've had many opportunities to kind of address the big challenges that are central to survival as a species, and we keep kicking that can down the road. And so, um, I don't know about you, but a lot of facilitated sessions, you seem to have a lot of the same conversations over again. Okay, let's do another value statement. Let's do another team chart or something yeah. like so you can so you can kind of waste a lot of time with conversations that are kind of fundamental. Can we get beyond that and yeah. get aligned and and really work in a like a teal sense or something about what is the good for us, good for the customer, good for the planet? Um, we yeah we're that's triple, the thing that I really triple P hope. yeah the triple yeah. P profit people planet yeah okay I I love that I I'm in on that I I also think that um, part of what I I think that you're probably excited about too is the thought that we could be in a virtual reality together that next time that we are together we are actually standing facing each other um, we might have an oculus on but we are standing there talking to each other in such a way that um, we feel like we are in a virtual space. That's and right. so that the Jetsons actually come into reality. This is, this is my hope that in my lifetime, I can actually see that <laughs> happen, you know, yeah. and, um, and that we are talking about things that matter, yeah. not things that are superficial. Well, you hit that right on the nose because the, th the things that I'm most excited about and, and we're experimenting, our uh, Steve Schofield and our labs team is doing really interesting things. The things that I love is the VR tools are being handed not to game designers, not for yeah. another first person shooter, they're being handed to facilitators yeah. that are coming up with immersive shared yeah. experiences around these well-framed questions. Yeah, Those are games worth playing. Definitely, I'm with you there. Now, if you were going to, um, if you were going to give any tips to people that were listening, now you've pivoted a couple different times in your career. So, but if you, in this day and age, if somebody's out there that needs to make some kind of a change, what would you, what change tip would you give them? What would you suggest? Um, you need to find someone that you can trust who will call you on your BS and you know and tell you a real friend, right? One that'll let you get away with it until it's not good for you to get away with it, and then they'll call you on it. And you need to find out um, uh, more ideally if they're people you actually work with, um, if it's a job pivot that you're talking about. You can do a personal pivot or there are all sorts of pivots, but you need feedback on how they see you, what your superpowers are that you're probably not present to, or you don't value because it's very easy for you. Um, and it can be eye-opening and that was that was a huge pivot for me at Autodesk and another thing we did was having only deal with the positive we weren't critiquing we were just like yeah. here's what's amazing about you and you got to share it with other people and there were tears it was very emotional yes people were like per suddenly present to this this amazing thing that people valued them yeah. for that thing and that allowed me to drop my panic over staying on top of the tech and being able to code and and i realized that's not my value my value is in this other emerging facilitation thing it's in the taking those skills about the empathy and the team building and the creating that space for the conversation and and having a, a enough of a, an interest a curiosity and a background yeah to be able to create that space yeah like that was that was a fundamental pivot that it is yeah. my job now as opposed I, to a side gig. You know? Well, and I would say that that in a way that your superpower that you can't see, right? It's on a door 
And all you have to do is have somebody point sometimes to the door and then you just walk through it and see what's in there. And that I think is the beauty of life is that you have these, you know, reflective tools that you've surrounded yourself with. These are people, but yeah. they actually are a great reflection of you because water rises to its level. So yeah. you're always going to be surrounded by people who reflect some part of yourself, even if they irritate you, that's <laughs> part of you. And so if you can figure out how to um, get feedback from them and learn from them and grow, I think this is like, that's such a great tip, Mark. Oh. I love that. I, I have to say, I have loved spending time talking to you. And I felt like we just got to one little piece of it, but I would love to, as I and continue to open up the, the mural box and see what else is in there and that we go into more of a VR space. I want to come back here and then I want to talk about that because that in and of itself is something very exciting that I'd love to get your perspective on. I'd be happy to anytime, Patty. All right. Well, I loved having you here, Mark. And you know, everybody that's listening, be sure to look in the show notes so you can figure out how to get, you know, connected with Mark and follow, follow him, you know, see what he's up to on mural. He just, you know, spoke at a big conference. So you want to see and follow him on LinkedIn because he's doing a lot of cool stuff and always posting something interesting. So I look forward to seeing you again, Mark. Thanks for spending time with us. And, you know, everybody out there, you know what to do. Go out there and until next time, up your creative genius, right? Right.